Alright, wife. New recording, but the same day as the previous ones. Chapter 36 is titled, Daughter of the Night. Perrin on the ship tries to find a cabin, and it seems the only one available is one that has Loyal in it. So Loyal immediately starts talking to Perrin. Perrin's like, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. When Perrin falls asleep, a gray fog surrounds him, and he knows this is no ordinary dream he's having, and the wolf he knew as Hopper appears before him. Hopper sends the the images to give to make Perrin think the words follow. Hopper wants to show Perrin something. They walk through the mist and they come across a meeting of dark friends. Apparently, the dark friends are being summoned to Balsamon in their sleep. Balsamon kills one of them in front of him for letting the boys escape Tar Valan, and he tells the rest to carry out his orders. After the dark friends leave, a woman appears, a very, very beautiful woman, Perrin thinks. And both of these people, Balsamon and the beautiful woman, seem convinced that their plan to serve the great lord of the dark will be the one that is successful. The two people, who we now know to be Balsamon and Lanfear, go their own way, uh, and so Hopper not having anything else here, leads Perrin away. Perrin's mind is racing with questions, but the one question above all else is, was this real? The other one pressing his mind is, how is Hopper here when I clearly felt him die? And neither of these answers are ones that Hopper provides uh, adequate explanations for. A moment passes, and Perrin becomes aware of another thing in front of him. He sees Ran being hunted by Mirdral. Ran channels the one power, white beams of flame, like pure white, uh, just extend to the Mirdral and the Dark Friends, uh, killing all of them. Perrin sees more Shadowspawn approaching and yells out, Ran, behind you! Ran turns towards Perrin's voice and immediately shoots with a, with a fireball. Perrin wakes up in great pain. As he looks down, he notices a small burn on his chest and decides it's time he goes to talk to Moraine about these dreams. He wakes Mor uh, Moraine, and Moraine tells him, Well, if the Redaja got their hands on you, they'd try to gentle you. I don't think it would work, though. This isn't the one power. This is something different. I don't really understand what the dreams have to do with it, though, she says. She refuses to heal Perrin's burn, saying to let it serve as a reminder that what happens in the dream happens in real life. Perrin then asks a different question. What does the name Zareen mean? And Moraine explains, um, huh. Well, that's uh, quite the name to give someone. Uh, that's the name of a high lady who sits around on her lavish chairs with servants all around, lamenting the boys kind of thing. Um, apparently, whoever would name their child, uh, um, whoever would name their child Zareen must think their child's going to be quite the heartbreaker. Perrin, uh, not really amused by this, goes on to the deck. And then it switches to Rand's point of view. Rand wakes up from a dream, fighting dark friends, and realized, oh my god, that was Perrin. Perrin was in the dream, and I almost killed him. And he has, realizes he has to be more careful. Suddenly, a group of travelers arrive at his campsite. Uh, they ask if they can share the campsite, and Rand, uh, skeptical, but agrees. Um but he still doesn't let down his guard. And he sees something that makes him worry, and suddenly he kills all ten of those people with his blade made of the power, a blade made of pure Sidon. It turns out they were dark friends, as they tried to reach out for their swords to uh, get the drop on him. Rand, uh, using the one power, lifts up the ten corpses, and forces them to kneel to him. To his surprise, they are actually eleven. 
He tells the eleventh man, who is still holding his dagger, he chose the wrong company of thieves or dark friends. He takes one of their horses and rides for Tyr, because Kalindor calls to him. The implication of the eleventh man, by the way, is that it was probably a gray man who Rand couldn't notice until after the fact. Chapter 37 is titled Fires in Carhine. Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine are on a ship going down to um, down south to try to get to Tyr. Egwene's been going into Teleron Riode every single night, but hasn't found any more information. Um, she sees a lot of things in her dreams, though. Rand being threatened, holding a sword that shines so bright it's hard to see, Matt playing dice in the company of an illuminator, and being followed by a man who isn't there. She sees pa Perrin with an Aiel and a fighting falcon and hawk, but none of these dreams seem to make any sense to her. She goes up to the deck to talk to Elaine, who's lamenting the fact that they're passing yet another burned-down village. They've seen quite a few uh, on their trip so far, apparently. And she's worried, Elaine is worried about the people of Carhain. Uh, Andor, which is Elaine's country, and Carhain have had frequent wars, but she still is concerned for the normal people. Um, but since the Aiel War, trade between the two countries has actually been good. Andor, Elaine's country, has been supplying Carhain with a bunch of grain to feed their people. As they're talking, Egwene suddenly has a realization. Matt is being followed by a gray man. That's what it means by him being followed by a man who isn't there. But Egwene laments the fact there's nothing she can do about it right now. But she wonders why he's being followed. The letter he's carrying from Elaine isn't dangerous. But Egwene just says, well, uh, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. And Elaine's like, hey, at least you're understanding the dreams more. Suddenly, there's a crash. The ship has hit something in the river and has run afoul of the land. The captain says they're moored. They can't get help without another ship to come by, and they're going to have to wait for one to pass. Now Neve's like, we're not waiting. Uh, put us on the bank. We're going to walk to the nearest town. If you guys fix the boat before we get there, great. Well, you can pick us up. If not, we're going to keep going. Uh, and so uh, they do so, and they start walking. But they didn't go very far before a figure in gray and brown rises from a bush directly in front of them. Chapter 38 is titled Maidens of the Spear. Egwene, seeing someone rise above her suddenly so close, reaches for Sidar immediately, but then realizes it's a woman in front of her, and she doesn't seem to be a threat. And looking at her, even though she's never seen one before, she realizes this woman must be an Aiel, a maiden of the spear. The woman, roughly her age, introduces herself as Avienda. Avienda wants to know if they are Aes Sedai, and Nynaeve confirms they are, which prompts Avienda to ask for help. One of her companions is wounded. Avienda leads them to her friends, who introduce themselves, Chayad, Bane, Jolien, and Dai Lin, also all maidens of the spear. Dai Lin was wounded in a fight with Karhain soldiers. Nynaeve goes over to her and tries to heal the wounds while talking about Aiel customs. Avienda tells her that Chayad and Bane are uh, first sisters, but that doesn't really make any sense to Egwene, uh, among other things that are discussed. Nynaeve gives Dai Lin a, a mixture of uh, herbs and uh, heals her with the one power. Avienda talks about how maidens of the spear have pledged not to have a man or a child. Um, they also talk about how Aes Sedai are very similar to the Aiel's wise ones, but wise ones can't be maidens of the spear. Wise ones have to give up the spear if they were previously maidens. Um, the Aiel are also apparently a clan society. And maidens of different clans don't fight one another. The maidens are a sisterhood of their own within each clan. Um, and then when she, when Avienda realizes Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine are being somewhat defensive, she assures them we would never 
harm another woman who doesn't have a spear, especially not an Aes Sedai. And the chapter ends. Chapter 39 is titled Threads in the Pattern. With Nynaeve's healing work done, uh, they say she, the, the woman needs rest, and then they ask directions to the next town from Avienda. Um, and as they're leaving, Egwene asks one more question. How did you guys cross the river? I mean, you're in the Aiel Waste, which has no water. And uh, it seems like the idea of swimming uh, frightens you all. Avienda says, well, they cut down some trees and tied them together to cross the large river between the Wastes and the Andorran border. And then she asks, what are you all doing here? And they answer, as we as readers now know, they are looking for he who comes with the dawn, a man who, according to Aiel prophecies, will lead the Aiel out of the waste. They tell the Aiel that uh, they're heading for Tyr, and uh, they hope to meet again someday, and Nynaeve and them go on their way. And Elaine's like, I'm pretty sure he who comes with the dawn is Rand. And Egwene's like, yeah, probably. <laughs> and uh, as she acknowledges uh, the thought, Egwene is knocked out cold by a stone flung from someone's sling. Black surrounds them all. When Egwene wakes up, she is bound, lying on a horse with a number of men around her. One of them panics and notice she woke up, and before he can even reach her, she's hit again in the head by something and passes out a second time. When she wakes up for the second time, she is not bound, but locked up in a building made of logs and stone. She can overhear a conversation of her captors. The men apparently think that the three women are Aes Sedai and they want to sell them for a profit as slaves, essentially. But Nynaeve catches Egwene's attention. Elaine was hit very hard. She is seriously injured and cannot survive unless Nynaeve manages to heal. Nynaeve gets very upset at the fact that they've been captured and manages, thankfully, to grasp onto Sidar and uses the one power to heal Elaine even without her herbs. The three women plan to escape and as they burst open the door using the one power, they walk straight into a fight between a group of Aiel and the men that captured her on the side of three Mirdral. The Aiel quickly kill all of the men without any trouble whatsoever, but not the Mirdral. The girls channel the one power, killing two of them, and Nynaeve channels a white-hot flame that is blinding to look at and shoots it straight at one of the Mirdral, who disappears as if he had never been. Once everything has calmed down, Nynaeve finds out that the Aiel she healed before they were captured died in the fight to a Mirdral. She's very upset over this, and laments the fact that she, the girl did not rest even though she was ordered to do so. But a man comes up who introduces himself as Ruark, and Ruark just says it was her time. And the girls have a realization that the Aiel are very ready to accept death. They wonder how they were found, and Avienda admits uh, she followed them and saw them being captured. But by the time she uh, could do anything about it, it was it was too late to get there by herself, so she went back for help. Um, they're grateful that the Aiel were following for that time, and uh, obviously, and the Aiel offer to escort them to the town. Uh, they also talk again about their prophecies, and... Uh, uh, you find out another Aiel prophecy. Um, well, it, it's kind of a mix, right? So the Corinthian cycle, uh, which is the one in the main area that we are in, has a line that says, On the slopes of Dragon Mount shall he be born, born of a maiden wedded to no man. But the Aiel prophecies state something else. Blood of our blood mixed with the old blood 
raised by an ancient blood, not ours. And so you're trying to piece together all these different lands' prophecies into a way that makes sense. Chapter 40 is titled, A Hero in the Night. Matt and Tom's ship arrive in, the, in a town, and Matt tries to replenish his, his uh, coin purse by gambling again, and he succeeds. As Tom and Matt have uh, dinner in their stable that they have a room in, they hear a woman uh, coming in. After a few moments, she's followed by some men, and from the conversation that they're listening to, they understand that the woman is an illuminator who was cast out by her guild in Karhain after some recent accident that happened in their chapter house. If you remember, Rand did that. The men are following her because she's still making the fireworks, and they intend to kill her for it, since she is not a member of the guild anymore. Matt stops them and uh, knocks them out very quickly. The woman introduces herself as Eludra and thanks them by giving Matt some of her fireworks. She warns him, though, don't open them. You will explode. Matt's like, okay. <laughs> Before the men that they knocked out wake up again, all three of them decide they've got to leave. Uh, so Eludra goes her way, Matt and Tom another. Chapter 41 is titled, A Hunter's Oath. Perrin's ship has made it to the port of Ilion in the south. Um, well, it's sailing in. And he's very upset about the tension between Zareen and Moraine. Uh... See, Zareen was very open about the fact that she's a hunter for the horn and thinks that following them will lead her to it. Moraine was not pleased with this and looks at her with somewhat like anger or disdain every time she sees her. And all Zareen does is smile back. Which is very brave, Perrin thinks, being able to smile like that to an Aes Sedai. Lan even seemed to be amused by it. At one point, Moraine even asks him whether he saw something there was, that was funny, and he said, I would never laugh at you, Moraine Sedai, but if you truly intend to send me to Mirel, I must become used to smiling. I hear that Mirel tells her warders jokes. Guidance must smile at their bondholders' quips. You've often given me quips to laugh at, have you not? Perhaps you would rather I stay with you after all. And she gives him a hard stare because Lan is referencing the fact that Maureen said when she dies, she is already arranged to give his bond away to Miril, another Aes Sedai, compelling him to find her. Perrin thinks to himself, Ilion looks like a very large city as they approach. Maybe it's large enough to keep the wolves at bay. Surely they wouldn't hunt in these marshes and this heat that they're in. Because on this boat ride, twice had he found himself in the strange wolf dream, both of these times, Hopper appeared before him, chasing him away, telling them, You're too young yet, new, uh, young bull. Too new. Moraine didn't tell him any, that it meant anything, just telling him that he needs to be careful. As they step off the boat, Moraine says to Zareen, or Fail, as she likes to be called, that it's time to say goodbye. Fail refuses, convinced that they're going to lead her to the horn. And she tells them, nothing you or Lan will do, will, short of killing me, will stop me from going with you. Moraine looks over at Perrin as if accusing him of being the cause of this, and gives up trying to make Fail leave. So then she decides to change tacks. She demands that Fail swear on her hunter's oath to do what Moraine says, never to leave their group unless told to do so, and do nothing to endanger their company and finally, to not ask questions. Fail agrees and takes the oath. Moraine looks over at Perrin then and says, I suppose you've found Min's falcon then. Um, and despite my best efforts, she seems determined to perch on your shoulder. A tavern at work. And she's your responsibility now, Perrin. Fail and Perrin both start protesting. Fail saying, I'm no one's responsibility. I can take care of myself. And Perrin saying, I didn't ask her to be here. 
Fail then looks over at Perrin and says, Who's Min? And are you really a Taveran? He doesn't answer, but lifts her up and puts her on the back of a horse. And he reminds her um, his name is Perrin, as she keeps calling him Blacksmith. And that prompts Fail to say, Well, then my name is Fail, not Zareen. And the chapter ends. Chapter 42 is titled, Easing the Badger. The group rides through Ilian, and Fail tells Perrin about how this is where the hunters swear their oath to become hunters for the horn. Um, people also don't seem to be reacting to Loyal as much. Apparently, Ogier are not, while they're not common, they're not super rare here. And Loyal gets nervous, but Maureen assures him, I won't let anyone take you back to your steading. I may need you to travel the ways again. Perrin sees Fail is listening and perks up at that, and tries to warn them not to talk about it anymore. But he has some strange feeling, like something is wrong in this city. They go to an inn, and the innkeeper is chatting it up with Moraine, because they seem to know each other. And she's like, oh yes, a new high lord has been installed in the Council of Nine. No one really knows anything about him, and I actually had some weird dreams about him. Um, but yeah, he's one of the nine rulers of the country now, so I guess he's a lord from the countryside. Um, but the council has also forbidden ships to leave Ilian for Tyr, and Moraine is not happy about that, and smells fear on, uh, Perrin smells fear on her. Loyal hears from some people that all the Ogier in the city are actually gone. They all left during the winter, but nobody seems to know why. Perrin realizes he's, in, he's feeling very tense and excited. He realizes he feels like a wolf just before a fight. And as he eats, he smells wrongness. He's smelled it before, but couldn't identify it. But he looks over at Moraine and Land, and they don't seem to be worried. They can sense shadow spawn if they get too close. Perrin looks over as he eats and sees six men enter the inn, and he realizes the smell is coming from them, and they're carrying knives. Perrin yells out a warning to the others and rips a leg off of his chair to defend himself. The men make a beeline for him, seemingly after Perrin. The fight is over in seconds and all six of those men lay dead on the ground. Lan and Moraine identify all six of them as gray men. Moraine now has given away the fact that she is an Aes Sedai, as she had to channel to fight. The innkeeper gets rid of the bodies, and Moraine says, or Moraine laments the fact that she's ignored the fact that Perrin and Matt are Taveran too long. She's only been so focused on Rand, who is the most powerful Taveran, she neglected to pay any attention to the destinies of Perrin and Matt, who are, aside from Rand, the strongest Taveran in hundreds of years. She decides she needs to go out into the city to get information quickly, and tells Lan to stay with the others and guard. Chapter 43 is titled, Shadow Brothers. Lan immediately starts questioning Perrin, how did you recognize the Grey Men? I didn't even sense them. It's beyond the capabilities of any warder. And Perrin just says, he smelled them, and he recognized the, the smell from previous towns. They were hunting Rand back then, but now they're after me. Land decides to secure the perimeter of the inn and asks Perrin to join him, since Perrin may catch something that Land misses. He doesn't know what he's looking for, but says he'll know it if he sees it. They look around for a while, and Perrin smells like sulfur, but then he notices Rand looking, or excuse me, Lan looking at something, and the smell of burnt sulfur is stronger here, and Lan is looking at the prints of what appears to be a giant dog. Only dogs don't leave footprints on stone. Lan tells him the prints must be from a dark hound to leave an imprint on stone. They go back into the inn, and Lan tries to convince Fail not to follow them and says, I will release you from your oath right now if you leave this moment. She says no. 
Lan, realizing that if they couldn't sense the Dark Hound, Moraine must not know they're, that they're following, goes out to find her. He tells the others to get some rest since they probably won't be staying the night. Perrin takes the advice and goes to bed, and he dreams of the wolf dream yet again. He tries to find Hopper, but at first he only sees Matt playing dice with Balzaman. The scene changes and Hopper is there in front of him. Perrin asks him, why did you show me last time the meeting between Lanfear and Balzaman, or Moonhunter and Heartfang as Hopper calls them? Perrin also asks, is what I see real or not? But Hopper doesn't really give him a good answer to it. Perrin tells him, I'm being hunted by gray men and dark hounds, which Hopper thinks of as the not dead and the shadow brothers. And Hopper tells him the last hunt is coming and Perrin must flee the dark hounds. And with that message ringing in his ears, Perrin wakes up. Fail is there when he wakes up. Uh, she doesn't really understand who Perrin is yet um, and starts wondering, but Moraine bursts into the room. She announces to everyone in the room, the Forsaken are loose, and one of them rules Ilion. Chapter 44 is titled, Hunted. Moraine announces it's Samael. Samael, one of the Forsaken, rules in Ilion, and they need to leave now before he realizes they're here. She gives Fail another chance to leave, but Fail doesn't take it. The group hurries to get their horses. Moraine announces that it seems Samael sent the Dark Hound, but not the Grey Men, which would imply there's more than one Forsaken working in the city. Perrin says, what? They're all dark friends. Why aren't they working together against Rand if he's the Dragon Reborn? And then catches himself. Moraine immediately locks eyes with Fail and says, There is no way back now, because Perrin said too much. Now Fail is stuck with them, because she knows Rand is the Dragon Reborn, and that must still be somewhat uh, kept under wraps. As they race out of the city, they hear howls, the dark hounds calling one another. Moraine is scanning the hills in front of them, looking for something, and, the, and they stop. And Perrin wants to know why they're not moving. The dark hounds are so far away still. Land says, not even the fastest horses can outrun a dark hound. We have to face them. Moraine finds a good spot where they can make a stand, and Perrin gets his bow out. Land says, you're probably not going to kill a dark hound with a bow, but it's worth a shot. The Dark Hounds come quick, and Perrin shoots as soon as the pack of ten Dark Hounds is within bowshot. He looses arrow, 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 and it takes three arrows to kill one. Moraine, grasping the one power, channels it and shoots out a beam of white-hot fire, blinding to the eyes, and kills the remaining nine. Fail asks, what did you do? And Moraine says, something forbidden. Perrin is asking, uh, what's going on? Why, why only the Dark Hounds? And Moraine's like, well, we weren't Samael's main concern tonight, it seems. Just an annoyance to get rid of. Uh, Perrin's like, I wonder if he was after Rand instead. And Moraine's like, it could be Matt. He blew the horn of Valir after all. And Fail's like, w what? The horn was found already? But Moraine cuts it off and is like, we gotta go. The perspective then shifts to Matt. They're on the road to Camelin. Matt ignores all advice and opens up a firework by cutting it. And uh, Tom calls him a fool because he doesn't want to get killed by an explosion. But as Matt cuts it, the fireworks do not explode. They don't even really make a big bang when he throws the insides into a fire. Four people approach their camp, and Matt gets pretty suspicious. They ask for directions to an inn, but Matt, out of the corner of his eye, sees one aim a crossbow. Matt jumps away, and the three, women, or the three men with the woman are taken out very quickly, but Matt pauses upon ki before killing the woman. He tries to talk with her, but before she can even say a word, one of Tom's knives is sticking out of her throat. 
Matt turns to Tom, demanding to know why Tom killed her when he, he, she was at his mercy. And then Tom points to the knife that just fell out of her hand. She was about to sneak kill Matt. Matt still feels guilty about killing a woman, though. Uh, the only other thing that I missed mentioning is uh, after Perrin killed one of the Dark Hounds, Fail kind of complimented him on his bow skills, and Perrin like stood up a little bit straighter in his uh, in his on his horse. But then when he realizes he did that, he goes back to slouching because he doesn't like the fact that that was his reaction. Okay, that's all. Chapter 45 is titled, Camelin. Matt and Tom enter Camelin. Matt kind of remembers the city from the, their first visit with him and Rand, but a lot of his memories are patchy. He, he only remembers certain little bits of information since the time he left the two rivers. His, his memory is full of holes, essentially, and so he doesn't remember the city very much at all. They go to the Queen's Blessing, the same inn they stayed at in, in the beginning, and uh, got a meal and a bed from there. Matt, deciding that there's no reason to really delay the delivery of this silly letter, goes up to uh, the palace, and he goes up to the guard and says he's from Tarvalon to deliver, and the guard cuts him off, saying the Queen wants nothing to do with the White Tower until they return the daughter heir. Matt tries to explain this is a letter from the daughter heir, but he can't even get the words out because the guard announces ar arrest him. Matt turns his horse and runs away uh, as quick as he can, and he joins back in the joins Tom back in the inn, and realizes he should have just said Elaine's name first. Why did he go into this explanation? Ah, alas. Matt goes back to the inn and uh, is asking. Man, they really don't seem to like Aes Sedai. And the innkeeper, Basil Gill, is like, Well, yeah, Morgas, Morgas has a new advisor, Lord Gabriel. And uh, Lord Gabriel does not like Tar Valon. Gareth Bryan didn't like Lord Gabriel, and so Gareth Bryan actually left the city, and he was the old captain of the guard. Then Matt is like, Well, I guess I just got to avoid the guards to deliver this uh, letter. And Gil's like, what letter? And Matt's like, it's from Elaine. And Gil's like, you should wait until the guards have been changed. Um, a lot of them are more loyal to Lord Gabriel at this point than anything else. But Matt's like, just have food ready for me when I get back. I'm not going to talk to the guards next time. 